So if you if you go down to the top of page seven, there was this open source 101 course. And this was one that Ruth and I had kind of put together. And it's kind of tied to our chapters, I'll be real honest. So the intention here is that um, chaos is, a focus of chaos is supporting the health and sustainability of open source projects, wherever they might be and however people want to participate. And so um, engagement with open source by a more globally diverse group of people is healthy and sustainable for everybody. That, that improves health for open source just broadly. So part of what we're doing here is, is just trying to introduce you know, what open source can be for people. So we've run into a number of folks who just are, are completely new to the to open source in general, not, not even chaos, just understanding what open source means and, and how it can be understood. So I had put together kind of a series of slides here that kind of bring that forward. This is an older deck, actually. I included a GitLab logo there. Um, but just kind of bringing forward why, in this case, organizations might want to participate in open source. And then the second half of this, Ruth, and I see the hands up, Ruth had proposed kind of, now that you understand what open source is or how it's applied, um, how might you as a person think about joining an open source project that is of interest to you? So this is, to your question, this is kind of the first slide deck that we've put together and it's not necessarily focused on chaos. So Rhea, yeah. Well, the only question I had about this, Matt, is there are a ton of courses in the Linux Foundation learning portal. Yeah. And there are also various onboarding and learning education about open source in to do another yeah. Linux project. Yeah. So I'm just a little concerned about expending effort to potentially duplicate something that already exists. And I, I have not trawled the depth and breadth of these courses, I would like to take a sabbatical to do that. But uh, uh, that aside, I think we run the danger of overloading people by adding another variation of something that already exists. I think this is a point well taken and a concern that I share as well. So I think we, it's just, in, we're gonna need to take a little bit closer look at the landscape of existing courses um, to ensure that we're not duplicating, just like you say, Ria. Yeah, Ruth. Yeah, um, it's it's really it's a great point that Ria made. Um, but I would speak from the perspective of actually checking out those courses myself when I started open source, because I I looked at the you know the Knox Foundation courses a lot. I. I took some even though I didn't finish all because they're very long, right? So um, with looking at this content we have here, um, I think to some extent um, there's been some practical sense, like the way uh, Matt kind of like started from open source in general sense down to how um, companies use it, you know, to real life applications, you know, it's, I, I think it's, it's, um a shorter content compared to um the one that the Linux Foundation like on the Linux Foundation courses and I also do not know the cadence to which they update those courses as well and like what is the you know the feedback um how do people give feedback to to LF as well so um yes we should also be concerned about you know not duplicating efforts and you know but I also think that um, this is also maybe a modern way we can think about doing new stuff just in case we cannot, because then Chaos Project is a Linux Foundation project, so we should be able to give feedback to the LF, um, but in case we cannot really change things fast there, but I think we can also do something here. So yeah, so I wanted to add.
Daniel, I know you had your hand up and now it was down and now it's back up. So yeah, you're on. one more. Yeah, sorry, yeah. one more question. Um, what would be, first of all, I'm a big proponent of open source courses um, and that's how I got started. But okay. trying to think about like, for example, using GitLab as an example, um, yeah. what would be the draw of having something like GitLab do an open source course through chaos as a platform mm -hmm. rather than, you know, a company, any company doing their own course on their own, you know, platform? Like, what, what's kind of the elevator pitch to get a company to do this through chaos? Could you kind of, ex oh, like having like members at an organization do this course? Is that so like, like if you're trying to partner up with an organization to do a course on chaos's platform? Is that that's kind of what I'm getting right? So if we were to reach out to GitLab and say, we'd love for you to provide a course on um, repository management in the GitLab platform, and we think that this might be useful. Is that kind of the, where you're going? Yeah, and like why yeah. why do this on this chaos platform rather than do it on our own documentation site, our own you know website get, kind of thing? Yeah, I get what you're saying. Um, I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> it's a, it's a good question. Does anybody have some initial thoughts on that? Yeah, Justin. Yeah, I guess I came. This is always the one one week of the year where I can join these meetings, or two two weeks of the year with the time zone. Two weeks of the year. Well, it's good to have you here. <laughs> yeah, well, it's with the the time zone. You know, next week I'll have my conflict back, so I'm I'm here for this one. But to me, this is really interesting, and I, I've kind of been following some of the other conversations around the LMS piece. So for me, like my question is like, what is the 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 boundaries or the scope? I guess it's similar to, to what. Um, Daniel was asking, I was like, for me, I'm thinking of, there's like two examples that I have. One would be, you know, I, for context, I work a lot in the Fedora project, which is a, a Linux distribution project. Um, and we have, you know, I'd like to train people on certain basics of like working in a very large decentralized community, which is not always the, you know, single repo. Like I work with 30,000 or 40,000 Git repositories and six different platforms so it's like I, I i see a use case for trying to understand like how these kinds of communities are built and how do you engage in a project that's so so broad so like that can be some kind of content that's not necessarily chaos specific but is just more general purpose and then i also have something that like you know for my project um it would be a little more detailed like say like how do you do xyz thing in fedora um you know i and you know we I'd like to integrate, like think of ways to tie that into the chaos piece a bit, but these are the things I'm thinking about, like, oh, like this would be a really interesting way because I'm trying to come up with similar things in my community around like how to train newcomers and open source and to do mentoring. And I don't have access to a tool like Moodle. Um, like that certification piece is really interesting and having that step-by-step -step course curriculum is really interesting to me. So I guess that's my question is just trying to understand like if there's been much thought into what those boundaries or scope might be. If it should just be general purpose things, if it can be multi-community like specific in the in the platform. Um, those are just things I'm thinking about going through this because it's, it's definitely it's it's super interesting to me because I've been spending a lot of time in in my in my role thinking about these kinds of topics. Well, thank you for that, Justin. Um, I I think at least from what I understand, at least at the moment, that there were some, the courses were meant to be general purpose, just in terms of engaging with open source. And I think that was your first question. And then at least I th my thought was, is more specific courses would be with respect to chaos. So if you, don't have a, if you as a person don't have a project in mind, here would be a way to participate with the chaos project. But I think to your point, mm -hmm. um, maybe as an example, Fedora might have an, uh, an interest in saying, here are the general ways to think about engaging with open source. Here are a couple projects that you might wanna consider, one being chaos, one being Fedora. Am I hearing this right, Justin? Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, I, I think there's a case for making a Fedora course that maybe isn't part of chaos. Is that, I mean, it's, 
Because yes. it doesn't really like Fedora is an operating system. Chaos doesn't really make sense. It's a landing pod for that a lot. But if you need a platform, let us be your platform. I was thinking, uh, listening to you talk, do you have a, a comment to Justin? I'm sorry. No, go, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Um, I was thinking too, Daniel, I mean, one of, I'll think about this more, but one of your questions about, you know, why would a company want to make a course or an organization want to make a course and host it on chaos? You know, I think one of the things that we do provide is a very neutral spot for those classes. So chaos is pretty neutral. We would have them narrated by potentially by chaos members. And I think sometimes the perspective on say engaging with GitLab from an external person <laughs> could be a little bit different than <laughs> engaging with GitLab from uh, a course developed internally. So I, that might be an interesting thing to think about. Yeah, just, just to comment, absolutely. And I think one of the problems that my team's identified with uh, contributing back to GitLab as open source contributors is that um, a lot of the documentation is written by team members who are very experienced with contributing yeah. to GitLab. And so the idea of getting outside external perspectives to me is very interesting. Okay. Yeah. So that might be something to think about here in this regard. Okay. And I've, I have one, if we have time, one additional comment about <laughs> chaos specific courses. Yeah. Um, because this is the DEI working group. Um, I think it, uh, there's probably an opportunity to have a, like a DEI training course. I know that's something that a number of organizations are looking for, for their team members. Um, and the out in tech just did an inclusive leadership training a couple of weeks ago that was well attended. And I thought very well done. Um, it would be interesting if chaos could do, you know, a DEI sort of um, training course that organizations could point, you know, employees to go to. Mm -hmm. um, uh, who is that, is, did you say out in tech? Is that a conference or? Uh, mm -hmm. Out in tech is an organization. Um, yeah, that uh, they do events and conferences and trainings. Yeah. Okay, great. That would be something good to get on the, if you get to talk to them and see if they want to contribute content. Um, all right, great. This is, I really appreciate these conversations and this is really great. Um, I think too, this is, this is a slow process, which is good. So in developing the courses and getting them out there. So I don't, you know, we're not really rushed on, on time on this. So I think mean, getting a lot of input along the way is really helpful from everybody. So thank you. Um, any other comments on, on things here? Okay. All right, good. Um, I did want to give some some updates on badging. So um, for those of you that hadn't seen, Justin, I don't know if you had seen this, but we, you know how we have the DEI.md file? We had, uh, um, oh, here we go. So if you go to the top of page four in the minutes, I'll include it again. I just want to make sure everybody knows about this, that, um, we have we've broken up the DEI.md file to be just a template. It's almost just like an basically we had a lot of stuff in the sample DEI.md file, and it was kind of confusing to read. <clears throat> and so we have just a template file. You can click on it there, and it's really just that, and then a guide file that would talk about how you would think about filling out that template. So I think that's pretty well um, squared away. Um, so I just I just wanted to draw that to people's attention. And I'm all I all I've ever heard is really positive feedback on that. And I see Rhea gave a thumbs up and I really appreciate it because we want to make these things approachable, um, but still offer guidance for people who are developing these DEI.md files. Um, I'd also like to to let folks know that I think um, GitLab is producing or helping support a way to log in to GitLab as well. So the current uh, proposal or uh, I'm sorry, the current prototype that we had developed kind of up until this date um, was built around GitHub. And so you would log into GitHub, you would use your GitHub ID um, so that you could um, submit a badging request on orgs that you own within GitHub. And we didn't have functionality to do this with GitLab. And so I, I feel like GitLab is going to be making some contributions to provide that as well, which is awesome. So I really appreciate that as well. So people would be able to log in using either of their credentials um, and then put a repository through the badging review process to be awarded a badge. So that's, so thanks for that. 
Um, Um, I also, as we as we move um, as we move the project in out of kind of the pilot phase and into more of a you know, like a production phase, um, we there are two parts. I just want to reiterate this. There are two parts to the project. So one of the first parts is uh, a community has a DEI.md file located in a particular repository, wherever that repository might be. They have filled out the DEI.md file and they click, um, they, <clears throat> they create a submission to get a badge for that DEI.md file. Um, the process ensures that the DEI.md file exists, that it's well structured, and that there's not um, nonsense written into the file itself. And a badge is issued really based on that. And our review process is. We encourage communities to, um, you know, share this within their own community and the review process is really on the particular content within the DEI.md file is provided by that community. So for example, if you if a community is making a claim on inclusive leadership and community members don't feel that what's represented in the DEI.md file is indicative of that community, a conversation can occur within that community. It's not, it's really too hard for us to make that judgment call. There's also a second part to the badging, um, the badging process, which is to provide an inclusive language report, at least in the first one, back to um, back to the submitting, <clears throat> back to the submitting community. So I think for the first um, for the first rollout of this for production, we're not going to include that inclusive language report back. For now, we're just going to include at least this is the proposal, to just include the badging. We just really want to make sure that that process works and works well as a, and is stable. So if people apply for a badge on the GitHub platform or the GitLab platform, the, the badge is, is issued and it works well. And we understand that there aren't any process concerns in there. I do believe Sean will still be producing the inclusive language report, but we're just not going to be sending it back. <clears throat> at, at yeah, just to keep that tech ready to go if we have to ramp up. So if we actually grant the higher level badges, we probably are gonna need that. So it'll still be there, um, but it's just one thing at a time. Let's just make sure this first part works and then we'll get to the second. So does anybody have any questions or comments just about those two parts or kind of why we might be doing this or criticisms for doing it? <laughs> Open to all. <laughs> Yeah, Daniel. Um, could you share a little bit more about the inclusive language report? I understand that's something that would come later, but um, would that just be scanning like the, the DEI file for inclusive language or what else? Is that doing something else? Go ahead, Sean. It could look, it's it, the intention is to have a set of recommendations for increasing inclusivity. Um, and we're using some libraries of inclusive language that are provided by a federal government project to scan through the actual comments on issues and pull requests primarily. To, statistically in the background, it'll provide a score um, based on some machine learning algorithms, but ethically, I don't want to share that score. So the, instead of sharing a score, we have a range of 25 to 30 specific recommendations around advancing inclusive language on a project. And the score will sort of direct which ones uh, get made for individual projects. So the idea is that we want to uh, provide some degree of scalability for project badging, because if something like this takes off and people want to badge up levels, then we're going to be beyond the scale of 100% human assessment and evaluation. And it's at that point that we would need something to help us reduce the workload. Um, So the, I mean, as we move, I guess, Sean, I mean, the way we've talked about this, but as we move up like silver and gold, I mean, part of it is building out the DEI.md file itself. So the, yeah, absolutely. Yep. At the bronze level, we have at the yep. moment four yep. metrics. 
And silver, kind of that earlier conversation would include six metrics. As an example, gold would include attention to eight metrics and platinum would include attention to 10 metrics as examples. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, and the, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was sorry. just going to say that the difficult question to answer is at what point does a project that started with three people and still has only three people, at what point are they not being included? Is there not a even indication of including others that that would be, I think, necessary at some level of DEI badging for a project? So I think one implication of DEI badging for a project is if you're interested in diversity, equity, and inclusion on an open source project, we would expect the number of contributors on that project to grow from some badging level to some other badging level. Now, whether bronze to silver is where that happens or whether um, gold to platinum is where that happens or where that starts, that, that question's unanswered. But I, I think we risk a, a pretty significant problem with perception of the utility of the badge if we're not looking at growth in contributors um, as part of what it means to be more inclusive. So the, the report that would be provided, Daniel, is meant to go back to the only to the person who has applied for the badge. And it would kind of highlight areas where inclusivity may be improved within the project. Um, to that end, the report itself does not necessarily need to be addressed. You know, like they, there's not a response that re is required against the report, but we may in the future ask for metrics around inclusivity to which the report could provide some insight as somebody moves forward. Does that help at all? Yeah, no, that's, that's a good explanation. Uh, I'd be interested to see it working on GitLab when we have like 20,000 open issues and if that can still run and scan through, but um, I'd, be, I'd be excited to see something like that in process. Yeah, I mean, we've done it in in pilot testing, so we could definitely, I mean, Augur is capable of scanning the messages of hundreds of thousands of very large repositories um, in the course of a very short period of time, comparably. I do think we're going to have to be, personally, I think we're going to have to be a, somewhat cautious in the rollout of any of reports like these. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. just not at you, Sean, but like as we... No, it's all yeah. true. Yeah, if we tell, uh, if we kind of imply that a community is not inclusive and they feel differently, <laughs> then that we don't want to create like tension. Well, and that's where, yeah, and that's where the non community. Yeah. And I think that's where providing sort of non acute suggestions instead of some kind of evaluation from a teacher, you know, framing, framing things is helpful instead of judgmental yeah. will be critically important for this. Yep. And that's that's a very critical it's just an important communication activity because we want to be effective, we want it to be useful and we will have to strike some balance of providing advice instead of judgment um, in order to help people move the ball forward. Yep. And also maintain the integrity of what it means to move up levels in the badging. Yep. If we get if we decide to go that way. Okay, um, so th I think those are the updates that I wanted to bring forward. So thanks everybody for badging. We have about five minutes left. Uh, lastly is chapter updates. So uh, Ruth, are you still around? Yeah, I'm still here. How did how did things go in Togo? Uh, <laughs> so it was good. Um, so I was for context. Um, I shared this yesterday, but I think there are some people that were not in that meeting. Um, I was in Togo last weekend for um, Oscar's chapter in Togo Lume, um, their open source day for Hacktober Fest. And um, yeah, I, I had a talk about, you know, growing tech, their tech career in open source and how... Um, how open source helps advance African tech communities 
and it was a very it was it was a humbling experience because um and relating and why I brought it up in this DI meeting is because I kind of did like a reflection on you know how much because Togo is a francophone country so their um primary language is French and I I used to know a bit of French very rusty um so it was one is that two two things I, I I'm reflecting on. One is the fact that I, I was able to feel how how much how hard it is for non-English speakers to, you know, converse in communities. Um the the whole conference, the whole event was held in French, which a, a huge part of it I <clears throat> did not understand. But that was that was fine. But it, it was also like an experience for me to see, um, and feel how how much inclusion is needed in, you know, in open not just in open source communities, but um, one is I was able to converse with some people that could speak English. Um, my session was held in English, and I was also scared if they were understanding, like like everyone was carried along with my session right um because i couldn't speak french at some point i had like some translations done but um just wrapping up here is there's i, I think there's because i i did invite some people to join the chaos community but i i'm also skeptical will they be able to participate in meetings will they be able to participate in calls so um just throwing out that question um or that thought out there on how we can better include um non English speaking countries. How do we like um I know when we had like with the Asia Pacific community there at some point they were their 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 meetings were run in Chinese at some point. But like this is just like a question out there. But it was a great experience, really nice people. Um we had like um swags to the hackathon participants and they were really happy and yeah so that's how it went mm, this is great i just i'm so happy you made it to togo and this is after a trip to angola as well <clears throat> with the group there so yeah absolutely amazing um and i like the question about it's a great question about how to um, include folks who don't speak English? I think that's really a good question. I'm sure that others have thought about it as well, but it's certainly something we should think about here in the Chaos Project. Um, I just, I wanted to let people know, I did talk with Ruth yesterday. Um, she's going to put together a photo album of all of the work that she's been doing in uh, in Africa. So this is whether it's Chaos Con in Nigeria or the meetups in, in Angola or the meetups here in Togo. Like there's just, if you're on the Slack channels and you kind of see the pictures, they're absolutely amazing. And we'd really like to highlight that work that Ruth is doing and recognize the people who are participating in these as well. Um, and I will say for, for people on this call, just one of the things that we are thinking about is ways to continue to support the work that Ruth is doing in Chaos Africa. Um, and so, and I'm talking financially support, just in terms of travel and supporting folks. Um, so this is something that Ruth and I are talking about as well. And we have talked about in the past when Chaos Africa began. Um, so just kind of letting you know on that. I don't know if you have any comments on that, Ruth. I think that summarizes what we talked about. Yeah, I th I think yeah you did you did summarize um and then because usually like traveling for this like we provide them with like swags um and that's something we're able to do with the with the Oscar Lome chapter the one in Angola as well so providing them with material resources to you know support um their open source contribution and you know encourage them to keep contributing as well. All right. Well, Ruth, thanks for thanks for all of that. Um, we are done with this meeting. 
we're at 51. So this is a really great conversation. I really appreciate everybody being here. Thanks for the all the feedback and thoughts. Good to see everybody. Thanks so, for sharing. Yes. Talk James. with you later. That is. All right. And Daniel, if you want to talk about that too.